Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. I was actually going to do all of the Narnia books in one video, but that plan has now changed. And basically because I got to number three, The Horse and His Boy, uh, I was reading them in series order because I got them in a box set and that's the order that it kind of came in. And I really didn't like that book, but also I don't have much to say about it. It's just not much happened and it was very dull. However... That's that book. And this is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which I have slightly different feelings about. So, uh, I'll read the blurb. They open a door and enter a magical world. Four adventurers step through a wardrobe door and into the land of Narnia, a world enslaved by the power of the White Witch. When almost all hope is lost, the return of the Great Lion, Aslan, signals a great change and a great sacrifice. I tried to read this as a kid, and uh, I never really got into it that much. I, I read like half of it, and then I think I DNF'd it as a child. And for no particular reason other than that, I guess I had other books lying around, you know. I did the same with Treasure Island and recently reread Treasure Island and, you know, fell, you know, quite, got quite a lot out of that. Uh, there's also illustrations in this version which kind of made it quite enjoyable to read. I'm going to go through and pick out some of the flags that uh, I put through there as well. I'm going to start with this. I think this is quite adorable, this little introduction here. To Lucy Barfield. My dear Lucy, I wrote this story for you, but when I began it, I had not realised that girls grow quicker than books. As a result, you are already too old for fairy tales, and by the time it is printed and bound, you will be older still. But someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. You can then take it down from some upper shelf, dust it, and tell me what you think of it. I shall probably be too deaf to hear, and too old to understand a word you say, but I shall still be your affectionate godfather, C.S. Lewis. I just think that's a really sweet little introduction, and presumably where he got the name Lucy from as well, you know? I like as well, so right at the beginning, before they the kids even go off and discover the land of Narnia, uh, they're, in, they're in this sort of old country house and it starts raining, and uh, Susan goes, uh, Do stop grumbling, Ed. Ten to one, it'll clear up in an hour or so, and in the meantime, we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. That does sound ideal. Like, I would stay inside even if it was sunny outside. So Lucy heads through and we have, uh, she meets, straight away she meets a fawn called Mr. Tumnus. And uh, he says, good evening, good evening. Excuse me, I don't want to be inquisitive, but should I be right in thinking that you're a daughter of Eve? And this is something that was also in The Magician's Nephew and kind of a tie back to... You know the the biblical sort of themes in the stories, but I also think it yeah I quite I quite like that you know daughter of Eve son of Adam or whatever it is I think that's right isn't it yeah and then um, the fawn is, is telling him all these stories and uh, sometimes sometimes even of Bacchus himself who is the god of wine and drinking and then we have Edmund the most fundamentally unlikable character in the book <laughs> I I've always hated Edmund and I still do he has like a slight redemption but I still hate him. And uh, he goes through to Narnia and uh, he says, I say, Lou, I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I see now you were right all along. Do come, do come out. And then he goes, just like a girl, sulking somewhere and won't accept an apology. All right, Edmund, you sexist dick. Fucking hell. It's the 21st century now, mate. So here's further proof that Edmund is just a horrible person. So... Edmund and uh, Lucy manage to find their way back from Narnia into our world and they meet up with uh, Peter and Susan and uh, and Lucy goes, Peter, Susan, it's all true. Edmund has seen it too. There is a country you can get to through the wardrobe. Edmund and I both got in. We met one another in there, in the wood. Go on, Edmund, tell them all about it. And Edmund gave a very superior look as if he were far older than Lucy. There was really only a year's difference. And then a little snigger and said, Oh yes, Lucy and I have been playing, pretending that all her story about a country in the wardrobe is true. Just for fun, of course. There's nothing there, really. What a dick! We also, I noticed throughout this, there's time and time and again, there are references like this where uh, he goes like, Peter held the door closed but did not shut it, for of course he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never shut yourself up in a wardrobe. And this is like repeated so many times throughout, I think at least three or four times, where it got to be, it felt as though C.S. Lewis had put that there knowing kids were going to climb into wardrobes and he was trying to stop kids from, you know, getting into trouble, I guess. So Edmund gives himself away and reveals that he had been there before. And uh, there was a dead silence. Well, of all the poisonous little beasts, said Peter, and shrugged his shoulders and said no more. 
There seemed, indeed, no more to say, and presently the four resumed their journey, but Edmund was saying to himself, I'll pay you all out for this, you pack of stuck-up self-satisfied prigs. And it's like, Edmund, you're going to pay them out for what? For catching you in your lie? Maybe you shouldn't have lied. I mean, to be fair, this is aimed at kids, and, and that is the very clear moral here, you know. Oh, and then uh, Beaver says, they say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And it goes, and now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. And it's like, well, he was mentioned in book one, because this is book two, at least in this order, and in this box set that I got. And also, I think Aslan by now is, like, culturally widespread enough that people probably do know who he is, which is... Kind of a testament to the success of the books, you know? Now this quote here, which offended my vegan sensibilities. Uh, All the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat good fresh four to fish if you eat it when it has been alive half an hour ago and has come out of the pan half a minute ago. We have a little poem here. Let me read you this little poem. Uh, right above a reference to uh, Daughters of Eve again as well. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. We also have another one of the old rhymes, which is like a prophecy that that kind of gets, I think, or I understand it gets like sort of followed throughout the series, you know. Uh, when Adam's flesh and Adam's bones sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. Half rhyme there at best, but we'll, we'll let them get away with that. Oh yeah, and then Edmund goes missing and they, they worry about him. And it's like, oh, just just leave him. It'll be fine. I do like this sentence, there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And then uh, the kids, they basically decide they're going to try and head the witch off. And um, so they're getting ready to travel. <laughs> and Mrs. Beaver goes, I suppose the sewing machine's too heavy to bring. And I'm, it made me wonder what kind of sewing machine it is, because surely they don't have electricity in Narnia. I'll read this little paragraph as well. This one was quite an interesting little bit. It's all right, he was shouting. Come on, Mrs. Beaver. Come out, sons and daughters of Adam. It's all right. It isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course. But that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia. In our world, they usually don't talk at all. Usually. And then they meet Father Christmas, which I don't remember from the movies. And I think they might have taken it out of the movies. Because it would have been a bit weird. But... Well, I suppose Father Christmas was St. Nicholas, but, I mean, yeah. It wasn't he invented by Coca-Cola. Uh, and he goes, these are your presents, and that they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. Uh, so he gives Peter a shield and sword. Susan gets a bow and quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. And then Lucy gets a little bottle of what looks like glass, but people said afterwards made of diamond, and a small dagger. We have this sort of... This quote here, which I don't know whether it'd fly now. Battles are ugly when women fight. We have this this sentence here, right? Unless you have looked at a world of snow as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. And I'm fairly sure by this point, I'm sure he's only been in Narnia for two days, and it's like, I don't think that'd be long enough for you to get really disconcerted by it. We get this little, this little exchange between Peter and Aslan, which... Seemed almost quite violent for a children's book. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it all smeared with a wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it quite clean on the grass, and then wiped it quite dry in his coat. And then Aslan, Aslan turned him into a knight. Aslan hands himself over to the witch, and then she kills him, but then he comes back to life because of this ancient magic, but really it's Christ being reincarnated. I, I didn't like this bit as well, because I don't like it when books get like self-referential and meta almost, so it goes, I hope no one who reads this book has been quite as miserable as Susan and Lucy were that night, but if you have been, if you've been up all night and cried till you have no more tears left in you, you will know that there comes in the end a sort of quietness. You feel as if nothing was ever going to happen again. At any rate, that was how it felt to these two. Because they're sad because Aslan died, only he's not dead, don't worry. We have this very disturbing paragraph that I cannot condone at all. The noise was like an English fox hunt, only better. Because every now and then, with the music of the hounds, was mixed the roar of the other lion, and sometimes the far deeper and more awful roar of Aslan himself. Yeah, no, fox hunting, like, is not, is not cool, man. Oh yeah, and then Edmund redeems himself by smashing the witch's wand. But I hate Edmund, so I don't care. And then we have this answer to something that that I was talking about with, with my girlfriend, where we were like, surely by the time they go back to our world, they're gonna be like adults in 
children's bodies. But it says here, and Peter became a tall and deep chested man and a great warrior, and he was called Pete, King Peter the Magnificent. And Susan grew into a tall and gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet. And the kings of the countries beyond the sea began to send ambassadors asking for her hand in marriage, right? So that's all good. And then they go back through the wardrobe and there were no longer kings and queens in their hunting array, but just Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy in their old clothes. It was the same day and the same hour of the day on which they had all gone into the wardrobe to hide. Right? And then, so, are they now all their, like, 40-year-olds in ch children's bodies? Is that ha how this book ends? And, th and then, in The Horse and His Boy, they're in Narnia again, so I guess that happens between then and when they come back. Because that's what confuses me. Like, are they now adults in children's bodies? And is is that not, like, quite an awful thing? And then will they die when their bodies get old or when their minds get old? Maybe that's c covered in the rest of the series. I don't know. But, yeah, all in all, it was, it was all right, actually. It was a 3.5 out of 5, and I'm glad I read it. I'm not glad that I continued on with The Horse and His Boy, and now I'm really not looking forward to reading the remaining four. Um... I probably will do a little review of this, actually, just to get it out of my system. And, uh, yeah, maybe I'll review the rest of the books as we go. We'll see. But on that note, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.